Hi everyone, my name is Vanessa. I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date is October 8th, 2017. And today I want to talk to you about religion, politics, and sobriety. If any of these words are pretty triggering to you, I would encourage you to just take a moment and just consider this, what we call the set aside prayer in AA, which is to humbly come before your higher power and ask, God, please enable me to set aside everything I think I know for an open mind and a new experience. Help me see the truth about my relationship to religion and politics in sobriety. That's a really good prayer if you enter any situation, <laughs> whether it be your finances, relationships, job, traffic, whatever it is. It's a good little hack to really center yourself. But I want to talk about religion and politics because I feel like long time I haven't been able to set my finger on what it is about what these two topics means to me as a sober person and as somebody Tony Campolo recently passed away he was a co-founder of Red Letter Christians and although I never personally met him I have worked with the other co-founder Shane Claiborne it occurred to me that the reason I was able to develop a strong relationship with God is because of the work that Tony Campolo did through Red Letter Christians. When I became a Christian, like 20, when I really began to like explore this and take this more seriously, I, it was during the middle of like max exodus of people leaving the church for a variety of reasons. And there are a lot of faults within the church. I know that even the word God sends like shivers up the spine of some people because of the religious trauma they've experienced. And then you add the 24-hour news cycle and people blasting churches and religious leaders spouting words of hatred, segregation, and divisiveness. It's really difficult to look at this image of God on Fox News or CNN and be like, okay, if that's the God that I'm seeing proliferated and populated on all the screens, then that must be the God in the church down the street telling me to vote against gay marriage and that I don't have the right to an abortion, even if it's medically required. And if that's the case, then how is this God supposed to help me stay sober? You go into an AA meeting and they're like, find the higher power that loves you. And it's, I'm not seeing that reflected back to me anywhere. Even though there is some responsibility to be taken in that, right? There's some reflection that needs to come here. Do I really believe that's what God, the creator, or my higher power, my spirit guides, do I really believe that's what they're propagating? If you could sit with that. But when you're drunk or hungover or coming down <laughs> or just coming back from an overdose, it's really difficult to have that capacity of understanding. And so how people end up getting sober is because somebody is kind to them. It is that genuine warmth and kindness and that genuine connection with another addict and alcoholic that gives them the hope that maybe there is something more to this life than what they are currently experiencing. And for me, I became Christian in the early 2010s, and then I was still drinking during that time. But the reason that I became Christian is because I did have this deep knowingness <laughs> that God was good. And I did feel that and I did see and experience God in my life, but I didn't have a proper way to express or worship or create a routine around a God when the churches that I was going to were just like wildly closed-minded. They talked about things that I didn't believe God would say. <laughs> It just didn't feel accurate and that I could actually contradict in the Bible, right? The message wasn't there of the love and the hope that I needed. Then I did finally get connected with the church when I was really looking for some more groundedness in my spiritual life. I heard about Red Letter Christians and Tony Campolo, who has this quote that's pretty famous. It was something like, let me look it up because I don't want to butcher this. <laughs> I have three things I'd like to say today. First, while you were sleeping last night, 30,000 kids died of starvation or diseases related to malnutrition. Second, most of you don't give a shit. What's worse is that you're more upset by the fact that I said shit than the fact that 30,000 kids died last night. He was pushing us to question what we're actually valuing. Are we just valuing indoctrination, following the, the rules, or are we actually trying to do the work of, of Jesus, of God? Are we here trying to make 
a difference in the impact in the world that we've been born into. I, I became, got more involved just reading about Red Letter Christians. They're based in, in Philadelphia and would talk about racial injustice, sexism, reproductive rights, and the LGBTQ community. So many things resonated with me. The greatest commandment of all is love God and love your neighbor. That is everything we should be basing our lives on. Love God, love your neighbor. These things resonated as truth. Red Letter Christians go by the words in the Bible that Jesus said, typically highlighted in red. And Jesus was very much a socialist. He was an advocate for the poor, the sick, and the disadvantaged in communities marginalized by larger religious groups at the time. And that's very much what we're seeing even today. It's an incredibly relevant message. And so with Tony Campolo passing away, I just couldn't figure out, even though I hadn't met him, and even though, yes, I worked at this organization that he'd co-founded, I couldn't understand how why it was such a deep wound. I just felt like the air knocked out of me. It is because during those times when I would hear these wonderful messages and I'm like, yes, all of this resonates for me. I was still an alcoholic. I was still a drunk. I was still hung over. I was still vomiting. I was just like a disgusting creature. And I remember thinking, I just don't think I'm ever going to be able to help anybody with my life. And I wish I could do all these cool things. And I just don't think I'm going to be able to pull it off. I just don't think I'm going to be able to have an impact. And then I did go to AA and they try to tell you about this higher power. That one just seemed really impersonal because we weren't really calling it God. We were just calling it higher power. Then I got into the big book awakening, which does bring it back to how it came from the, oh my gosh, I totally just <laughs> blanked on the name of it. The Oxford group, for God's sakes. <laughs> I still have not finished my copies. I'm in the process of loading still. The Oxford group, which was a Christian group, didn't really specialize into alcoholism. Bill Wilson jacked some of that stuff and incorporated it into the 12 steps and made it very specific by adding the medical aspect of alcoholism so that alcoholics could resonate with that. It's still around. It's helped so many millions of people, including myself. When they talk about this higher power in AA, and I think it's very important, it's incredibly important that everybody come to their own understanding of what their higher power, which I'm going to refer to as God moving forward, is. I like James Finley's definition of God. God is everything that has created, <clears throat> everything that exists in this world that has the ability to create. God is every atom that is created, the nucleus, proton, electrons, and all the space in between. God is everything everywhere all the time. And, he, and God is incredibly loving. This was my knowing of God. It, it continues to expand as I continue on my sobriety journey, which is why this channel has always been focused on spiritual growth. This is the work, right? And I get to grow by working with other people and by having new experiences and by coming against different challenges in my life and overcoming certain things. This is how I get to know God. That is the intimacy of God is my reliance upon God to get me through all of those situations. Well, that was my inner knowing and what had originally gotten me to even become a Christian to begin with in 2010, 2012, when I enter into the rooms of AA, I'm like, okay, but then where do I go to worship this God who hates gay people, who is telling me that I don't have the right to get an abortion and the one that I'm seeing being represented as so hateful? Like, why would a God like that care about an alcoholic like me? <laughs> I had a really split thing. And for probably the first year of my sobriety, anytime I was asked to share, I would constantly talk about having these two gods. I have the God that I know is the Bible. And then I have this AA God that I feel like I'm supposed to go to church and find in a church and worship. And I just can't make them meet. <laughs> I just can't make this make sense. And as I got more involved with Red Letter Christians, as I got to learn more about Shane Claiborne and Tony Campolo, I began to see the work reflected of love and justice in their work that I was like, that is the God. That is the same God that would care about getting me and keeping me sober. Because of that realization, I was able to merge these two ideas and really be able to develop and go to church and be able to take what resonates and leave the rest. I really got to deepen my relationship and have a way to express it to people. I didn't want to become a Christian, you guys. I grew up Catholic. I thought it was a cool religion. I'm actually getting back into that. I recently got my rosary here and I'm very much into that. I am very committed to the practice of 
faith throughout my spiritual journey, it has taken different shapes and it will probably continue to change as I continue to grow and expand my understanding and knowing of God. But when I was able to really incorporate this idea of the red letter Christian type of a God and see it reflected in people around me, then I was able to say, okay, this is a God that can really help me. A God that I can do business with is what they typically say when they're talking to you in AA about finding a higher power. And so this is it. This is the God. And that's essentially how I've been able to maintain my sobriety. That is the God that I rely on, that I pray to, that I count on, that I have faith in. This is not about politics. This is not about Trump. This is not about Harris. This is not about Biden or anything. This is about who we are reflecting and how we're using the, the name of God, right? Like, how are we reflecting God in this world beyond the politics, which I ha I will say, I have seen like churches handing out pamphlets telling you how you should vote. This is not how it should work. <laughs> these are entirely separate things, but one influences the other. We can't negate that these are still very intimately connected topics. That's why people always say, stay away from religion and politics, because these are very intimately connected topics. And the reason being that if your heart is hardened, the policies that get passed will also be hardened and will be exclusionary and dehumanizing. But if it, your hearts are soft and warm and they are to perpetuate love to all communities, regardless of their perceived worthiness or benefit, then to you, to capitalist society, to whatever at large, you just know the inherent worthiness and value of every single human life. If you voted with that intention, if you voted with that understanding, the policies and the people in power would also change. And I don't think that's a utopian society. I think that pretty shortly we're going to see ourselves falling to that out of desperation. If we can't get there by ascending in some beautiful, magical way, which I wouldn't rule out. It's just the history of humans leaves me to believe it will have to come to a crumbling in order to a rebuilding. When we are perpetuating this very judgmental, this very hateful, divisive type of a God who's very legalistic and not loving, not forgiving, not compassionate, not grace giving, not merciful, then we are telling the potential addict and alcoholics that there is a God out there who doesn't care about them, that they are not actually worthy enough to be saved, that they're actually not worthy enough to have a different life. This has actually nothing to do with Trump or with politics specifically, because I do know that there's a lot of addicts and alcoholics who are pro-Trump, pro-Harris, and whatever side of the coin you're on, you're going to dehumanize the other side. And that's exactly the issue that I'm concerned about. And that I think Red Letter Christians was really good about trying to separate religion from this dehumanization, very divine and essential souls. And I feel like that's all I have to say on the topic. I just want to reiterate that it's very sad that Tony Campolo has died and he's left an amazing and beautiful legacy. And I'm just so proud to be part of an organization that is really trying to live out the words of Jesus in the best way that we can. And there's a tremendous amount of pushback in a lot of the political ways that we try to change and create change. But we're, there's never going to be laws and policies around hearts and love. And that's actually where the real change is going to come. Rest in peace, Tony Campolo. I'm forever grateful for the work that you've done for Red Letter Christians. And I send a tremendous amount of love to Shane Claiborne and everyone else on the RLC team. And I think that's it. I love you. One thing I forgot to mention that I know is another hurdle for addicts and alcoholics who are struggling to find and rely and depend on a God or a higher power that's going to keep and get the, it's going to get and keep them sober is this idea of like, how could there be a God in this world when there's so much tragedy going on and we see so many, so much violence perpetuated against other humans? Like, why would a God allow this? And the position that Red Letter Christians or that Tony Campolo kind of takes or took was that, and Shane Claiborne is really good about saying this as well. Is one, it's not God creating all this chaos. It's typically a hardened heart in the human being and fear. But also, like, we are 
the answer to our own prayers, right? If your neighbor down the street is starving and has no food in their cupboards, like it is actually our responsibility. Like how could God let all this happen? How could you also have the ability and the the capacity to help people who are struggling and who are in need and to have a voice and to take action for these things that bother you. I think it's a very holy and divine calling that when something upsets you to say that affects me in a way that I should want to take action to help. And it isn't an overwhelming, it should not be an overwhelming thing to think about. Just take one cause at a time, just take one person at a time and all it takes is to remember that at the core essence of each of us, each of these bodies, we are just the divine manifest. We are just a physical representation of our holiness, of what can't be seen, which is our spirit, which is our soul, which is our heart. And so that's all I wanted to say. And I forgot to mention that. Okay, bye.